dear colleagues, uh, welcome to our workshop. Thank you for joining us today. So we are research fellows of the Teaching and Research Laboratory of Lena Kopra. And today we will present you some results of uh, our study of academic writing. We hope that this workshop will be useful and will help you to write a bit more like experts. Um, next slide, please. So here is our plan for today. Uh, first, I'll briefly tell you about our project. And then we will focus on three syntactic features that we selected for today's workshop. Um, they are the passive voice, nouns modified by prepositional phrases, and concessive clauses. All of them play a significant role in academic prose and are likely to uh, pose some problems for Russian learners or readers. So let's get started. Uh, we have been studying features of academic writing for over four years now, and we have tried different approaches to their selection. Initially, we used various study guides and textbooks in academic writing and collected features that were recommended there. But as it turned out, those features were frequently not specific for academic discourse. They were simply typical of high proficiency, right? So we uh, further analyzed research literature on the topic and decided to use features uh, suggested by Douglas Biber. So you might have heard this name before. And uh, co-authors who conducted a massive proper study of text in different registers, academic prose, conversation, news, and fiction and detected features uh, most typical of each register. Uh, this approach guarantees that these markers are really more typical of academic writing compared to uh, other types of discourses. Uh, in our laboratory, we collected uh, two types of opera in six disciplines. You can see them on the slide. So uh, expert corpus comprising research articles published in leading peer review journals and a learner corpus, which includes research proposals written by our fourth year students. And uh, we compared the use of 40 features of academic writing in expert and learner corpus. So, um, you can see some corpus data on the slide. You can see the size of our corpora uh, and the number of markers that we uh, analyzed. So, and also some statistics we gained. So all this information is presented uh, on this slide. So, and today we will talk about only three features from our list, but uh, these features share some characteristics. First, they are extensively used in academic polls. Second, they play an important role in all the disciplines we studied. And third, as we found out, they cause some problems for L1 Russian speakers, or I'd better say writers of English. And the first feature that we are going to talk today is the passive voice. Uh, I want to start with a short quiz. So please, uh, on your telephones, um, uh, go to the link from the chat. So uh, my colleague will send, yes, thank you very much, Tatiana. So you can follow this link or you can sc scan the QR code you can see on the screen. So, and yes, just a second, I will now share my screen and we will uh, start. Okay, perfect, let's start. So this quiz is about um, the passive voices we have already guessed. And um, let's see uh, what you think about it. So you, you will need to mark some statements, true or false. So the first one is here. Uh, the passive is more common in academic prose than in other registers. 
um, for example, conversation. So let's wait for people to vote. Okay, so some statistics. Most of you agree with the statement, but we've got 35% uh, of those who disagree, who don't believe it's true. But in fact, the statement is absolutely right, at least according to some research uh, that was conducted by Douglas White and co -authors. Okay, next statement. So passives account for approximately 25% of all finite verbs in academic prose. Do you believe it's true or not? Okay, let's look at statistics. So again, most people believe it's true, but uh, we've got, we have 38% of those who don't think so. And the correct answer is yes, the statement is true. Again, according to Viber and our data, uh, passives really account for approximately quarter of all finite verbs in academic discourse. Okay, statement number three, the passive is widely spread in all disciplines. What do you think? Well, it should be easy because I've actually mentioned that today. So here even more people believe it's true and that is absolutely right. Okay, and now some statements based on the data that we um, gained. So the passive voice is most frequent in economics. Well, just try to use your intuition and try to guess. We know for sure and I will share the correct answer with you a bit later, but you, I think, can try to guess. Okay. And in fact, this statement is false. So a bit later, I will uh, share some statistics. I will show some data and you'll see that this statement is really false. And the last, the final statement. So overall, Russian novice writers, in our case, that is uh, our fourth year students, tend to underuse passives and their texts. Underuse, well, compared to experts, that is, use passive, uh, passives less frequently than experts do. Okay, so this is almost 50-50. And in fact, the statement is false. So that is the other way around. Actually, uh, Russian students tend to overuse the passive voice in their text. And this thing we are going to focus on today. Okay, so I am just uh, finishing sharing the screen and let us ask uh, Dmitry Sergeyevich to share it again. So Dmitry Sergeyevich, will you please? Okay, yeah, next slide, please. So here is some statistics that I promised, which uh, proved me right. Uh, so uh, here uh, you can see the disciplines that we studied. So there are six of them. Uh, and uh, some statistics we gained on the use of the passive voice. 
So as you can see, it is really widely used in all disciplines, but it is especially common in computer science. And yes, overall, learners tend to overuse passive structures in their texts in comparison with professional writers. Um, OK, so um, now let's uh, talk about the main functions of the passive voice in academic writing. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the passive voice is uh, frequently used to describe aspects of scientific methodology and analysis. And here you can see uh, an example. So uh, for example, data were analyzed using constant comparison techniques. So this sentence uh, is obviously from a data and method section of a research article. And the passive voice functions here as a tool to describe aspects of scientific methodology and analysis. Then the next function is to report findings. And again, you can see an example. So transforming skewed variables has also been found to increase bias. And uh, one more uh, function is to express logical connections. For example, our conceptual definition uh, aligned with work of Amit and Shoemaker, among others. OK, uh, and now let's move on to practice. So look at your hand out, please. Exercise one. So your task here is to correct some errors in the use of the passive voice uh, in the sentences from our learner book. Uh, well, I will give you some time, about three minutes to do that. So you can type your answers in the handout, and you can also send your suggestions to the chat. And then we will discuss them uh, together. So three minutes to do that. Okay, so I see that some people have finished and well actually yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, the, the time is over anyway. So let's uh, look at the suggested answers, though most of you have actually given them in the chat. So yeah, you're absolutely right. In the first um, sentence, there was an error with the form of the structure with, which requires B plus plus participle. So that should be, will be based. So number two, yes. So some of you have also identified the tense error. There was a problem with the tense of the passive voice. It should be past since the beginning of the sentence is in the past. Then uh, the third sentence. Well, uh, here no passive is needed at all. So just literature seems, and that's it. Uh, uh, in sentence number four, some of you have even detected some article related errors. Uh, well, that is good. However, I'm not sure that we um, can be absolutely certain about that since the sentence is given out of context. Anyway, talking about the passive voice, so it is not needed here. We just need uh, infinitive, like in order to describe or alternatively in order the implication to be described. So passive infinitive would be, would be used here, not a future uh, simple passive. And in sentence number five, yes, so also no need in the passive voice. This example is actually similar to number three. So in this example, you can see an inanimate subject that is uh, his model. Uh, and this subject agrees with an active verb. And I should say that such structures are very com common in academic writing. So no need in passive. Okay, now let's go further. Um, one more exercise for you. Uh, here you go, uh, we, have, we have dealt with the form. And now let's also focus on the function of the passive voice. And in this case, we will be looking at experts' texts, not, um, not 
not extracts from uh, our learner opera, but extracts from our expert opera. So in exercise two, you are asked to answer the following question. So which sentence uh, of um, uh, paper do you think this extract belong to? And you are asked to find examples of the passive voice and um, to answer question about their function. So again, you've got some space in your handout where you can write your answers and you can also send them to the chat. Again, you are given three minutes to do that. In three minutes, we will discuss your ideas together. Okay, the time is up. So uh, now you can check your answers. So look at the slide, please. Uh, the first extract was taken from data and methods. Yes, you you were right. Uh, I saw some some correct answers in the chat. So what still did was closed, and the function was to describe aspects of scientific methodology. The second extract uh, is taken from the results function, and the passive is there is just one passive are reported, and the function was to report findings obviously. And I hope that everyone has guessed that the final passage was taken from the conclusion section and no passive was used there, which is often the case in professional writing and proves that you should not use it all the time when you write your paper in English. So it's a stereotype that you need to use the passive voice every, every time in every section. So however, uh, as I have already told you, our students, um, Russian learners of English, um, frequently rely on the passive voice too much in the text. And in the next exercise, we will see it. So there is some more evidence of that. So look at the third exercise. It's on page two of your handout. So uh, you've got here some uh, paragraphs. Uh, from the learner poppers. So try to edit the paragraphs to avoid the overuse of the passives. So think how or what you can change in the paragraphs um, in order to, to, to avoid the problem. So, and here I will give you a bit more time, I think about four or five minutes. Okay, so I could see uh, really good suggestions in the chat. Thank you for that. In fact, as you understand, there is no correct answer to this exercise because your answers may vary. But here you can see uh, some suggested answers. So, Mr. Uh, Gage, could you please uh, switch to the next slide? Yes. So. Um, yeah, so this is just one of the possible uh, variants, but uh, I'm sure that you can come up with other variants as well. So, um, yeah, and this actually brings me to the end of my part of the workshop. So um, to sum up, um, I hope that I have persuaded you that the passive view, the passive voices extensively used in academic code. Well, this is maybe not something new that you have learned, but um, we can prove it with the help of our data. Then uh, the passive voice is very common for describing methodology and presenting results. And it's very useful for that. However, and uh, this is something to focus on. So expert writers often combine it with active structures headed by personal pronouns like we analyzed uh, or inanimate subjects. For example, the study has shown or the experiment reviewed. And um, I, I think that uh, you should pay attention to these structures and try to use them in your own right. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Ivan Alexandrovich, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. The next point that we would like to have a look at is a syntactical feature which is formulated as nouns modified by prepositional phrases. Uh, next. So what's a prepositional phrase? 
So, technically speaking, uh, it consists, understandably, uh, of a preposition, which is followed by a part which is called complement. And if you look at example three, uh, it often happens so that a complement in itself becomes a noun, which is modified by another uh, prepositional phrase, and so on and so on. So, on the night of the first day, uh, of the uh, of the event of me meeting my future wife or so, something like this. Uh, next, why are we looking at these things? They seem quite simple. Uh, first of all, exactly in the function of modifying a noun, prepositional phrases are essential for academic writing. Why is it so? Because prepositional phrases in themselves have this function of, as you can see in the slide, referencing uh, to something or providing elaborating information. And that is actually the essence of, I may say, any kind of research, elaborating information. We give uh, definitions, we try to get to the core of things, we try to describe something in detail. So that's why uh, prepositional phrases are one of the basis uh, of academic writing. Um, you can see that this feature is very frequently used uh, across the disciplines. But what happens with the Russian, with Russian learners of English is, again, similar to passive voice, they tend to overuse uh, this construction. What does it lead to? Um, over elaboration, too much details and unfocused uh, writing. So what we need to work with is, again, to make, try to make uh, this construction less. Uh, next, please. We will focus now mostly on uh, preposition of, which by far exceeds all other prepositions in all kinds of texts. Uh, and the guidelines for fighting this uh, preposition are very simple. Uh, we, we can change A of B construction into BA, and in this way, advertisement of Nike turns into Nike advertisement if you mean the advertising of a product, or into Nike's advertisement if you want to stress that this is the ad which belongs to a company as a whole. Or you may paraphrase in various ways using adjectives, verbs, or like here, a gerund. When advertising Nike, we do this and that. Uh, next, please. Uh, if you look at uh, your handouts uh, on page three, which starts a new section, you'll find exercise one. And let us practice uh, using these guidelines in order to change these little phrases. So you have three, three little short phrases and one not very long sentence. Uh, according to the rules I've just shown, and probably we may get back to them now, uh, to the previous slide, um, will you please change the syntactical structure, avoiding the use of preposition? Uh, it will be very helpful for me to have a look at your variants in the chat. Thank you. You've got pretty cool uh, variants. Many of them are similar to what I actually have. Uh, yeah, and in the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so a more uh, natural, idiomatic way to express the first idea is company branch, but not company's branch. Uh, in the second variant, yes, we have two possible variants, depending on what you would like to stress, which aspect, uh, management problems or managerial problems. Actually, there was another good variant in the chat, problems while managing something that will also do. Uh, Maslow's theory, if you mean, uh, if you'd like to stress the author, the originator of the theory, it can actually be also the Maslow theory, uh, stressing the idea that the theory worked according to the principles, but not stressing the authorship there. And yes, if you work with the uh, sentence, when we start from the center, uh, looking at the actors in uh, this uh, sentence, and then the majority of specialists of cultural studies may turn simply into most cultural studies specialists. Yeah, and the idea uh, will, can be expressed in a more succinct way. What does it mean that the point of view of majority of them? It means that they simply agree on some issue like cultural diversity important. 
And yes, all this can be found in this collection of articles or in the articles of collection as uh, some colleagues suggested. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the important thing with this construction is actually to notice it. It is so widespread and so uh, frequent and natural that we tend not to see it. And that's why probably many learners uh, overuse that. They don't see that they have too many uh, of these constructions. So that's why let's practice uh, to be attentive towards uh, this uh, marker in exercise two. Highlight all the instances of construction noun and prepositional phrase. How many can you find? I think I will give you one minute for that. That will be enough. Uh, and I don't think that it will be necessary to write that in the chat this time, but if you would like to, you may, of course. And I will leave one minute to explain some answers and the consequences that can be derived from this observation. Can anyone guess which part of an article this extra comes from? You may also use your mic, or you may write in the chat your guesses. Okay, we've got uh, a variant of an introduction twice. Intro three times. Overview or the background. People mostly go for the beginning of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, almost. Actually, that's uh, that's an abstract. So it collects all, all kind of all the basic information from the article. Mm -hmm. If you look at the next slide. Yep, there was uh, one quantitative answer already and it was correct. Um, so for 173 words, we have 10 constructions of this kind and they are evenly spread across the text. Once we have chain, a chain consisting of two components, amount of investment in information technology. So again, not too many, uh, not too little uh, of, of, of this thing. And if you look at the next slide, uh, I also underlined here noun plus noun phrases. Yeah, so uh, specialists in this field, instead of writing technology of information, for example, which would look absolutely strange, or efficiency of data mining, says information technology, data mining efficiency, computer application technology, and so on. And again, for the same uh, volume of text, we have 10 noun plus noun constructions. Uh, it seems that these things uh, correlate with each other. In the next slide, um, yep, I put uh, the two of them together. I will not guarantee well, a mathematical correlation, but there is some kind of uh, dependence here. Yeah? Uh, the less we use noun plus prepositional phrase, the more uh, we use uh, noun plus noun phrases. And Russian learners of English overuse prepositional phrases and very often underuse noun and noun constructions. So the idea is, yeah, again, to find the balance between the uh, ways of expression as uh, a person in chat was writing before, like we can balance passive voice with using we, for example. Yeah. The, same, the, the same way uh, we can do it here. Next slide. Uh, that is probably the most challenging task uh, in this part. Uh, this time you have an extract from uh, a learner corpus. And again, that will be an abstract uh, before uh, the project work, the, res the, the research work. Again, uh, let us first quickly go over and find all the uh, noun plus prepositional phrase constructions. How often do Russian learners use such constructions? Uh, in the next stage, uh, you will need to try to rewrite maybe some of the sentences, maybe as many sentences as you, you would like, maybe all of them, uh, in order to uh, decrease the number of such uh, phrases. Let's have a look at the next slide. 
Yeah. You see that the text is shorter, kind of one fifth shorter than the previous one. But the uh, noun and preposition plus uh, preposition phrase constructions are more frequent. They are almost everywhere. What happens? Loss of focus. So even if we have a look at just at the first sentence, uh, what is the subject of this research? Okay, is it some, that some kind of a period? Then it's Soviet teachers, socialization, uh, process of professional socialization. Yeah. Uh, what is the aim of the study? What is the subject focus? And so and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so let us spend somewhat about uh, seven minutes for trying to uh, rewrite uh, as many sentences as you find necessary to uh, make this number less and to make, as a result, I hope, this writing uh, more laconic and clear. Thank you very much for your suggestions. Uh, those that I see, uh, they are really definitely better than uh, the original text. If we can have a look at the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, the way that I try to, rely, to rewrite actually every sentence, probably that is too much. So that's a kind of experiment. But at least um, then in the first sentence, uh, the uh, ream of the sentence, the key part of it at the end is given to the uh, socialization. And we definitely know that that's the subject. Yeah? And then we're speaking about just simply Soviet school and Soviet government's tendencies. And for example, when in sentence three, we're trying to get rid of a very simple phrase, kind of very natural point of view, maybe we can arrive at something uh, which better uh, fits the uh, author's idea, maybe actually the author wasn't talking about a paradigm, but not a point of view. Yeah. And instead of using uh, in the next sentence, kind of the um, simplishly uh, sounding phrase, uh, lack of research, yeah, we have something like uh, this uh, topic is significantly under-researched. Yeah. So uh, the general idea is that you should try to make your text simpler, more understandable, more laconic, better focused, and just getting rid of some unnecessary um, uh, phrases will help you with that. Yeah, um, Astrid, as far as I know, uh, there are two ways of writing Soviet in academic literature, so I've come across uh, both of them. Soviet with a capital S and with a small s. Um, okay, if we sum up this part, next slide. Uh, noun plus preposition phrases are very frequent and they're so uh, simple and natural for us that they often become invisible. And as a result, we don't think how much we use them and don't we spoil our uh, writing with that overuse. This leads uh, to wordiness and loss of focus, including uh, research focus. So we need to find some kind of a balance between expressing things through prepositional phrases and other ways. Particularly, I think Russian learners should handle this noun plus noun construction, which is more frequent in disciplines like computer science, less frequent in humanities, but still is uh, very natural and idiomatic. As a result, your writing may be more succinct and direct and precise. Thank you. Uh, I give you to uh, Dmitry Terekov. Yep. Hello, <clears throat> everyone. I hope you can hear me. If you, if you can't, let me know. And our last part for today is another syntactic feature that we believe is worth some attention namely its concessive clauses and you might be asking yourself what does that even mean well you may recognize that uh, the word concessive comes from the word concession which in turn comes from the word to concede a verb and if you concede something you 
admit that something is true, even if you don't really want to admit that. A consensive clause is a particular type of subordinate clause in a sentence. Um, and in sentences where this semantic relationship is represented, the two clauses are both somehow true, valid, or accurate, yet they are mutually incompatible and very often one way or another contradict each other. So the consensive clause, the subordinate one, is given less importance and the main clause, as it is the main one, becomes more important. And at the same time, it is uh, rendered somewhat exceptional or remarkable. Whatever I'm saying is much easier understood if you look at the example. So like the one from the expert corpus of writing on economics, even though we had only 20 experimental plans across the 17 project firms, we obtained statistically significant results. Uh, the first part, which is italicized, is the concessive clause here. We see that this is a truth that the authors admit, even though they may be not really happy about it. But this truth that they are admitting allows them to make their main point in the main clause um, somewhat even more valid. So that's how concession works. Um, why do we talk about it? Well, these adverbials, we, these, these clauses, among other things, they are extremely common in, in the academic register. Uh, if you take a look at this statistic from Biber's huge grammar, you'd notice that actually concessive adverbials are the most commonly used adverbials in this register, and they beat stuff like cause and effect or result adverbials, which I don't know about you, I hadn't really expected before I saw this. Uh, so that's, that's one reason why we um, could um, want to pay more attention to them. And another reason is that language learners routinely underuse these clauses to a really huge extent. So without getting into those numbers, um, I can tell you that uh, very, very often in learner writing, you would find half as many concessive clauses or times, um, well, I mean, a, a really significantly lower number of such clauses than you would find in expert writing. So, and this concerns all of the disciplines, or at least all of the disciplines that we've looked at in our research. Uh, why is there so much concession in expert writing? Well, there might be a number of reasons. It's just one of the summaries that doesn't give out a lot of specific ideas. Yeah, but these functions might include showing the limitations of certain facts, events, or claims, or the general uh, goal would be to assist in developing an argument. And that's more or less what all academic writers do. They develop their arguments, taking into account lots of stuff. Um, here comes the exercise. I thought I had some other background slides. Uh, you can open your handout on page five and uh, look at, I'm looking at it as well, as a matter of fact, and look at the table. So in this table, mm. in the right column, you will find a number of sentences taken from the expert corpus, from the corpus of expert writing. And these sentences are taken at random. They do not, they are not intended to represent their domains, these are rather random, randomly selected sentences. And to the left, you might find some, mm. uh, well, some, uh, something that can be called a function of the concessive clauses in those sentences. So right now, I suggest that you take some time or minutes to match the functions that concessive clauses have in those extracts 
with the functions that we suggest for them. All right, so I see that some of the participants have sent their answers to the chat box and probably some of them are, are correct. Just in case we'll go through <clears throat> the answer key as language teachers do to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, so the first concessive clause and in the brackets, you could read the clause, um, we believe introduces a solution that already exists, but is not perfect and could be improved. And um, that's something that academic writers do. It may be not necessarily a solution, but it may be an existing approach, an existing methodology that is being improved in the current project and the project of the authors. Uh, the second one, the second clause, we think, yeah, um, okay. Mm. Now I'm getting lost, right. So the second clause uh, probably, uh, I can't read my own key if someone, if someone could help me. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it like the other way around. Uh, the, oh my God, should have prepared better. So uh, the second function then uh, would be attributed to clause C, right? That's probably how this key works. I'm sorry. I'm looking at, at your keys and they are correct. And I'm trying to wonder what, what am I even doing, right? So yeah, the second function highlighting the findings in the main clause by making them seem surprising. It goes with the uh, clause C, even though there were, no, there were no significant socioeconomic differences. And if you look at the whole sentence, well, the main clause would indicate the surprising result that the authors uh, have discovered. The third one, mm, mentioning existing research that has certain limitations. I think I actually talked about this one when I thought I was talking about something else. And uh, the following one, the fourth, a concessive clause can introduce, oh no, that's the one that I have talked about. So the third one mentions existing research that has certain limitations, that would be clause B. Uh, and here you can see that the names of the scholars are actually being mentioned. Those people did some research, but it can be built upon in the current project. So the last function reminding about the primary goal of the, uh, of, of this study in order to, to introduce the secondary objective. It's actually an example that I found quite interesting because, well, I've encountered a number of studies where the authors would do that, would say that they're um, actually pursuing a number of goals. And although some of them are more important, the others are still valid. So that's something that comes from, from the uh, from, from the last extract, from extract E. Now, I want to repeat that this is in no way a comprehensive list of things that you as an academic writer can achieve by using concessive clauses or by using concession in general in your writing. But these are some examples that are peculiar to research writing. So, as you see, this is stuff that goes with results, methodology, contribution. So this is why our next exercise would be for you to try and choose one of these functions and uh, implement it in your own sentence. Now you can use your, um, you can use some of the research that you have completed in the past, you can talk about an ongoing project that you're currently interested in, um, or you can even talk about somebody else's project that you're familiar with, right? So it's quite late. You have done a lot of tasks where you had to highlight something or correct something. Maybe it makes sense that you get down to do some actual writing by the end of this session, and there is no time limit for this. So 
if you are a time efficient person, you could produce even more than one sentence. And I will, I think all of us will happily look at them in the chat box and um, try and guess which function you've tried to represent. So for those of you who are not busy crafting their own sentences, an additional activity might be to try and guess which function is used in the sentence in the chat box. So nothing, nothing new here. It's just a repetition of the points that Elizabeth Alexandrovna made in the beginning. So just like all of our features today, concessive clauses and well subordinators as well are pervasive in academic writing and they are also crucial within it from a functional standpoint. Secondly, yeah, there is a huge difference not only in terms of statistical significance but also in terms of the effect size. Uh, well, between the writing, between the use of such clauses in the writing of uh, language learners and in the writer, the writing of experts. And concessive clauses, they do perform a variety of very important functions. So the fact that they are underused in learner writing could indicate that the argument as well can be strengthened, not only language. I think that was my last slide and I'm happily giving the floor back to Elizabeth Alexandrovna to make some conclusions. Yes, so thank you very much, Mr. Sergeyevich. Yes, maybe let me um, draw some final conclusions. So hope you are not too tired here participants. So, uh, well, yeah, I think we have repeated that like five times today or more, but all the discussed structures are essential for academic pros. That doesn't actually matter whether they're overused or underused, they, they're all very important and we should remember that. So, but yeah, as we have demonstrated, Russian novice writers frequently overuse passive verbs and nouns but prepositional phrases while underusing concessive clauses. So uh, you should bear that in mind when uh, writing your own text. And uh, a tip, that we can um, suggest here is that you should opt for a variety of syntactic structures in your text to achieve both the precision of expression and good academic style. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, could you recommend maybe some style guides or textbooks on the topic you have discussed? to the end related uh, ones. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, well, maybe I will start and my colleagues will add something. So as I have mentioned um, at the beginning of our talk of our workshop today, um, as we have found out uh, some of the study guides that are available, um, do recommend some um, you know, sophisticated syntactic features for academic writers to use on their texts. But as it turns out, they are not really uh, common uh, in real texts, in uh, expert writing. So that is why I would personally recommend uh, the book that Mrs. Sergeyevich has mentioned. That is called, Mrs. Sergeyevich, will you help me with the correct name? It's uh, Grammar of uh, spoken and written English, is that right? Uh, by Douglas Biber oh. and co authors. Yes, uh, and this is good because it is based on real data and it shows uh, the distribution of structures in different registers, and you can easily find those that are typical of academic writing and focus on them. There are plenty of examples there that illustrate the use of the, this or that feature. So, well, yeah, my uh, recommendation would be this one. So if uh, my colleagues can recommend uh, some other books, so uh, that would be great. Is there anything else for this? Could you spell the family name or, or the author? Yeah, I will do that in the chat in just a second. So it's Douglas, yes, Douglas Viper and Paul. 
I think I think we can just open the uh, the next chat next slide. Ah uh, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Yeah, here it is. By the way, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's actually number what? Yeah, number three on the list. Uh, by Boratal, um, grammar of spoken and written English. Right. I'll just add a little bit. So <clears throat> it's actually an older book. Uh, its its first edition was published in 1999 or something, and uh, well, if you if you ever find it, you'll notice that it's huge. It's upwards 1,200 pages, but there is a student version of it as well. So there is something like student grammar of spoken and written English, and the language there is less sophisticated and. Well, the, the recommendations are more practical. So I would actually recommend getting a student version of that grammar and using it as a reference guide while at the same time, maybe not relying too much on any guide, but observing the pattern in the real uh, research writing that you deal with. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we are going to wrap up. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for being with us. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Elizaveta, uh, Ivan, uh, and Dmitry for your wonderful workshop, for sharing your experience uh, and, well, your research with us. So um, we are looking forward to seeing you all at our next events. So please stay updated and um, we'll see you there.